Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode one of the Cathar Crusade, the Papacy versus the Preachers. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. By the early 1100s, the papacy had experienced decades of instability, as German kings, Roman aristocrats, and Norman dukes struggled to control Italy. Papal succession was rarely smooth, and there were frequently two rival popes at the same time, one supported by a German king, the other supported by a Norman duke. This was the situation in 1130 when Innocent II and Anacletus II both claimed the papal throne. Anacletus was backed by Duke Roger of Sicily and Emperor Lothar of Germany backed Innocent. Both sides were evenly matched, which led to years of warfare until the death of Lothar in 1137 settled the matter. Anacletus should have become uncontested pope, but he passed away in January 1138. As the last claimant standing, Pope Innocent held the Second Lateran Council in Rome the following year to solidify the supremacy of Rome, and thus the papacy in the Church, which would become a hierarchical organization centered on Rome rather than a loosely connected movement of charismatic poor preachers spread out across Western Europe. Some of those charismatic preachers were integrated into the church, satisfied with the establishment of their own monastery or religious house, accepting limited freedom in exchange for acknowledgement of the church's hierarchy. Robert of Arbicel founded the Abbey of Fontrevaux, which was radical for the time, since the abbess was given authority over men. Norbert of Xanten founded the Premonstantensians as double communities, which reflected the culture of northern France, the Rhineland, and Flanders, where couples married later in life and were usually equal in age, so they were partners rather than young women married to older men. Other charismatic preachers resisted integration and would be labeled heretics. The groups of heretics that sprung up across Europe around the same time resembled each other not because they were connected, but because they were reacting to the same changes introduced by a distant, centralized church that interfered with their local customs. Some of these reformers did not merely reject the corruption of the wealthy bishops and clergy, but key elements of the established religion, such as infant baptism and the emphasis on sex only for procreation. Many reformers flared out after a brief period of fame, but others suffered more serious consequences as a backlash from the established church. Udo of Brittany, whose followers sacked monasteries and churches, was declared a lunatic and thrown into prison. Peter of Bruet led his followers to break into churches until fed-up townspeople tossed him into his own bonfire on Good Friday of 1139. Let me take a moment to introduce a key figure in the backlash against the reformers, Bernard of Clairvaux. Entering the Cistercian order in 1112, aged 21, he became abbot of Clairvaux three years later and went on to found 65 daughter houses, basically branches, from his own abbey in Clairvaux, since monasteries were always founded in the countryside. Attracted by cheap land and solitude, they were separate from the thriving new centers of learning in the growing towns, which would produce dramatic differences in thinking. Bernard distrusted women, and this distrust was shared by many church leaders, since his fellow churchmen severed connections with convents to ensure that women would not be permitted near altars, schools, conclaves, or councils in order to remove temptation. Norbert had failed to give his female followers any permanent authority, so the nuns were forced out of the Premonstantensian order after his death in 1134. Driven by a faith that knew no compromises and incapable of acknowledging different interpretations of scripture, Bernard's main rival was Abelard, famous for his development of the systematic application of reason to determine the truth in each situation who had criticized the corruption of the church. Bernard saw Abelard as a rival thinker who threatened to tempt the next generation of clerics away from the path of pure faith to follow mental curiosity. When Abelard arranged for them to face each other in a public debate in 1140, Bernard 
employed his influence within the church to have his rival declared a heretic and banished to a monastery while his writings were burned. While Abelard had been silenced, his disciple Arnold of Brescia sparked the most notable outbreak of heresy in Rome, where the citizens declared a republic. Preaching reform of the church, Arnold wanted the papacy to abandon its claims to power over kings and end the pomp of the popes, returning instead to the simpler days of the early church in order to reconnect with believers. Arnold's growing influence ensured that Pope Eugenius was not welcome in his own city. Eugenius died in July 1153, and his elderly successor lasted only 18 months. However, the next pope, Hadrian IV, an Englishman, handled the matter by placing the entire city of Rome under interdict in 1155. This act seemed rash since he was a foreigner with few supporters in the city, but it worked. People might have survived the closing of churches, but the city's economy depended on pilgrims, and Hadrian had timed his interdict shortly before Easter, the greatest Christian feast, which attracted hordes of pilgrims. As growing crowds marched on the capital, the senators faced reality and expelled Arnold and his followers, just in time for Hadrian to celebrate Easter at the Lateran. While the struggle against heresy was important to the established church, it was primarily fought with ink and sermons, not swords and fire. But the nature of the struggle changed dramatically in the latter part of the mid-12th century. The question is, why? Oddly enough, Henry II of England was a key factor. I talk about this in greater detail in my series, The Devil's Brood, but... Basically, Henry had inherited Normandy and Anjou, gained the Duchy of Aquitaine through marriage to Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, and become King of England in the space of three years, all before his 22nd birthday. Having achieved so much at a young age simply fueled Henry's ambition, and he chose Count Raymond of Toulouse as his next target. Henry's claim was flimsy, essentially that the countship had passed to the Count's brother in 1093 when it should have gone to Eleanor's grandfather who had married the Count's daughter. Hoping to awe Raymond into submission, Henry summoned his barons from England, Normandy, Anjou, Brittany, and Aquitaine. Raymond's days as Count seemed numbered, but King Louis VII of France decided that Henry had become too greedy and took personal charge of the defense of Toulouse. Since Louis' involvement had protected Toulouse, the English king switched tactics and used the influence with the bishops of his lands to press Pope Alexander III during the May 1163 council at Tours to order the bishops and clergy of Toulouse to prevent anyone from supporting, sheltering, or even dealing with heretics. In particular, the Count of Toulouse would have to actively suppress the heretics in his lands, or the extremely pious Louis would find it much harder to defend him against Henry's insatiable ambition next time. And Henry intended there to be a next time. Driven out of Rome by Emperor Frederick Barbarossa and his puppet Pope Victor, Alexander desperately needed Henry's support, so he cooperated with the bishops. But it was probably not a hard sell, since it was doubtful that any pope was interested in the principle of religious tolerance. Two years later, in the winter of 1165-66, Henry had 30 men and women stripped to the waist, whipped and driven into the cold ordering his people to deny them comfort, thus ensuring that they died in the snow. This was the first mass repression of heretics in medieval Europe, and was probably intended to pressure Raymond to match Henry's violence or lose the support of the extremely pious Louis. Who were these heretics, and why was Henry confident that heresy would be a wedge issue between Toulouse and France? Calling themselves Cathars, they rejected the doctrine that God had created everything. Instead, they followed a dualist explanation of the world, where the physical world had been created by an evil god of darkness, while the spiritual world had been created by his rival, the good god of light. The evil god forced souls to be recreated to prevent them from reaching the spiritual world. Other differences were that Christ did become human, but his spirit returned to heaven, his body did not rise, and his mother Mary was an angel. Cathars emphasized consolamentum, 
which was similar to confirmation, and enable dying believers to be reconnected with their souls, ending the cycle of reincarnation. A quick note, the Cathars are also called Albigensians because a key center was the city of Albi. Their priests were called perfects and included both men and women. The decision to become a perfect was not taken lightly, since a perfect could not take the life of a warm-blooded animal, a potential host of a reincarnated soul, or eat anything that came from an animal, and must follow a life of abstinence. Despite their deep dislike of the church, Cathars other than perfects were permitted to attend church services. At first glance, the Cathars do not appear dangerous, but their entire creed stressed the irrelevance of the church, so there was no point in obeying its rules or paying a tithe, which was a threat. The church leaders enjoyed their monopoly and were not interested in competition for believers. Accepting that they would never survive in the north, many heretics had drifted south, searching for a safer, more tolerant environment in the mid-1160s, and they found it in the Languedoc. People in the Languedoc spoke a different dialect of French than the northern Languedoc. People in the south said Oc as yes, unlike the northerners who said well. The two regions were separated by more than languages. While French songs praised either piety or bloody conquest, or both at the same time, the northerners sang about love and adulterous affairs. In this open-minded environment, where the traditional feudal order was losing grounds to the bourgeoisie who made their wealth through trade and manufacture, appeared holy men who would set up their shops, win local acceptance through hard work, and spread their ideas. Rather than demand obedience, they would simply ask to be heard, and soon found many converts. The local nobles saw no threat, and were not asked to give any money, so they allowed these holy men to preach openly. While the male perfects would travel to spread the word, the female perfects established group homes for the daughters and widows of the artisan class and the lower levels of the local nobility, which would produce numerous converts who would marry and bear children who would be raised in the Cathar faith. Once they were finished with childbirth and had reached middle age, many would become perfects, possibly to ensure that they were finished with childbirth. The popularity of Catharism among middle-aged women makes sense. If they had survived the genuine dangers of childbirth, they may have become perfects to reclaim control over their bodies rather than remain baby factories until their luck ran out and they died screaming. Remember, there was no birth control at the time. Eleanor of Aquitaine was 44 when she had her 10th and last child, John, which motivated her to essentially separate from her preaptic husband, Henry. Given the established church's movement away from any form of female authority, it is not a surprise that many women found the Cathar faith attractive. Moreover, the Cathars believed that all forms of hierarchy, including the dominance of women, was created by the evil one and should be ignored when possible and endured when not. The region proved fertile soil. When Cathar perfects debated six bishops, eight abbots, the local Viscount and Constance, sister of the King of France, at Albi in 1165, the perfects refused to recognize the authority of the church, and the Viscount decided that it would be unwise to attempt to burn preachers who were popular in the region. Having survived a public showdown with the church, the Cathar leaders gathered two years later at St. Felix in May 1167, for their first large-scale conference. The growing trade with the various ethnic groups spread around the Mediterranean explains the Southerners' tolerance for the Cathars, since they had regular contact with Jews, Muslims, Greek Orthodox, and other faiths. Trade with people who did not share your faith required an open mind. Unlike Normandy, Anjou, and Champagne, which had become centralized authoritarian states in response to powerful Viking raids, the Languedoc had been spared invasion, so the numerous counts had not needed to develop a feudal society to efficiently employ military resources to keep the invaders out. As a result, there was a far greater percentage of Alodio land, which was free and did not require feudal service. The great counts of Toulouse, Foix, 
and Trancavel had initially been hereditary offices that became independent and then absorbed smaller counties and castles through conquest and marriage. But even their control over their domains was far from firm. The counts could not summon a feudal army and could not raise the revenue required to hire many mercenaries. The various counts further weakened themselves by dividing land among their sons. The greater lords, including the counts of Toulouse, adopted the system of primogenitor during the 12th century, but the lesser lords did not, so numerous castles were actually held in common by a number of knights, sometimes 30 or more. Moreover, women could inherit fiefs and rule them. Toulouse gained great wealth through trade and international trade fairs at Mouret, Carcassonne, and Saint-Gilles. This wealth fostered the growth of towns, which were often ruled by citizen oligarchies called consulates, reflecting the Italian influence. Determined to preserve their independence, these towns often warred against their counts and bishops, which probably explains why the bishops were unable to prevent the spread of heresy. Remember I mentioned Henry? Well, yet another pointless war to expand Henry's territories never happened because Raymond swore fealty to the English king in February 1173. The alliance with Louis had ended when Raymond annulled his marriage to Constance, Louis's sister, in 1165. Henry's marriage of his daughter Eleanor to King Alfonso of Castile and his youngest son John to the heiress of the Count of Maurienne threatened to leave Toulouse surrounded, so Raymond had swallowed his pride and bent the knee to Henry. This diplomatic coup signaled that Henry had become the dominant power in Europe. It also sparked the Great Revolt, a year-long war between Henry and his heir, Henry the Younger, who was joined by his father-in-law, Louis, King of France, and the Counts of Flanders, Boulogne and Blois, and the King of Scotland, and the Earls of Leicester, Norfolk, Chester, and Derby, and numerous barons in Normandy, Anjou, and Brittany, and his brothers Richard and Joffrey. Although Henry emerged victorious, everyone was exhausted, leaving Toulouse safe from Henry and his limitless ambition, until Count Raymond invited interference. In 1178, Pope Alexander sent a mission to Toulouse that included many diplomats from Henry's court. The mission was in response to Raymond's appeal to both Louis and Henry for help against heresy, although the real threat was secular. The independent-minded city of Toulouse had defied him and elected a governing council of consuls, making itself a consulate in 1176. Also, Viscount Raymond Trancavel had allied with King Alfonso of Aragon, who had ambitions in Provence. Count Raymond could not deal with these threats on his own, so he used the excuse of heresy to enlist aid from Henry and Louis. This was a dangerous strategy. Unsurprisingly, the papal legates found that heresy was widespread in Toulouse. Since the official overlord, Count Raymond, was clearly unable to crush the heresy, the legates could potentially declare Toulouse the medieval equivalent of a failed state, thus giving the nearby powers of the Capetian and the Angevin dynasties an excuse to intervene. So why didn't they intervene? Well, Henry's heir, Henry the Younger, had lost patience waiting for his father to die and revolted again in 1183, nearly starting a major war until he died of dysentery. The next few years were spent in pointless revolts by Henry's remaining sons until Richard allied with Philip of France to defeat Henry, who died days later. However, any efforts against nearby heretics would have to be postponed because most of the nobility of Western Europe went over to Palestine to retake Jerusalem from the Muslims as part of the Third Crusade. They failed, but they were kept busy, so the Cathars were basically left alone for a couple of decades, allowing the Cathar beliefs to take root in the Landoc. I will explain why the Church was able to turn its attention to the Cathars and how the Crusade started next episode. Thanks for listening.